He broke Herschel Walker's record for most touchdowns in high school history and also, according to Marcus himself, had over 300 plus offers. Coaches lining up just trying to have a meeting with him and his mother every single day after school until 10 p.m. that night. And for everything I just said, that is why I label him as the most sought after recruit of all time because I've heard some wild recruitment stories where they offer a bunch of money, but never anything quite like this. And he winds up returning to Oklahoma heading into that 1983 season, and there's a lot of talks about him potentially winning the Heisman Trophy. And here's where things get really interesting. His friend drops him off at the airport, but he never boards the plane. An entire week went by and here we are, the number one running back in the nation, Marcus Dupree, is missing in the midst of the college football season. This is Scott Hill, an assistant football coach for the Oklahoma Sooners over 40 years ago. And he went on to state that they had a freshman running back that was so talented, he scared the coaching staff because they didn't know what to do with all that talent. This is Barry Switzer, the head coach at Oklahoma over 40 years ago, who stated that same running back was the best player on the team within one week of practice. And now this right here, what you're looking at, this is that said running back. He goes by the name of Marcus Dupree, and he could bench press 400 pounds 10 times as a high schooler. Can't emphasize this word enough. As a high schooler, one scout stated that he was faster than Herschel Walker and stronger than Jim Brown. Another scout who lived over three hours away was going to write a report evaluating Marcus's performance in a high school game. And in that report, he only put three words. Quote unquote, it was indescribable. Imagine you're a college football head coach and you're looking for some reports on this young man. And all you see is something that says, quote unquote, it was indescribable. If that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. He broke Herschel Walker's record for most touchdowns in high school history and also, according to Marcus himself, had over 300 plus offers. Him and his family was getting so much mail from these schools, they had to start calling schools and telling them to stop sending it because they had no more room for it in the house. He is single-handedly, without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, the most sought-after college football recruit of all time. And I know, I know, I know, are you sitting here saying, okay, he's probably over-exaggerating that, and I'm not. Take a listen to this. College football head coaches every single day will be lined up down the street just trying to set up a meeting with him and his mom. From when he got out of school at 4 p.m. till 10 p.m. that night, he was talking to college football head coaches in person. And this is how crazy it was. That was normal to him and his mom. They did that for two years straight. They had a whole system for it. Every single head coach had a time limit of 15 minutes. And when that 15 minutes was up, they walked out and another head coach walked in. It was like a single file line. And here's one of my favorite stories. A college football head coach couldn't go see him play on a Friday night, so he sent the assistant coach to go take some notes on him. When that said assistant head coach returned to the head coach's office on Monday, he gave him the notepad. When the head coach looked at it, it was empty. The head coach was confused and he looked at the assistant head coach and said, where's the notes? The assistant head coach then proceeded to say, I don't even know what I just witnessed. He was in so much shock that he didn't write anything down when he was at the game. And I find that ironic because another scout, remember, I told you only a couple minutes ago, he stated that he was quote unquote indescribable. With all that great stuff being said, and I know it sounds great, unfortunately for this young man, his career, and more importantly his life, it went downhill, and I mean it went downhill fast. There's multiple different reasons things went sideways, but I'd say two of the biggest ones are Number one, him and the head coach at Oklahoma, they didn't get along. And number two, some, we'll just say, shady people, they were in his life. And where things really, and I mean, they really start to get on our story, is he was balling out in college. He was fantastic, but then he disappeared out of nowhere. And when I say he disappeared, I mean it. His mom didn't know where he was at. The football team didn't know where he was at. It was a huge mystery, and it got so big, a matter of fact, the FBI got involved. They was looking for him. This is one of the most fascinating stories I've ever covered myself, and I'll give you a little teaser. I haven't even told you one-tenth of everything that went on. And there's a lot of questions people have been asking about this guy even till this day. But however, it all circles back to the one, and I mean the one big question we're going to try to get to the bottom of in today's video. What really happened to Marcus Dupree? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, hope all of you having a great and fantastic day. If not, hope this video can make it a little bit better. And major shout out to, I believe I'm saying this correctly, Deacon071. If I'm saying your username wrong, I do apologize, but y'all can all thank him in the comment section down below because without this comment right here, we would not be making this video. I'm absolutely loving these videos of Forgotten College Stars. Thank you for that. Former Oklahoma running back, because I tell you guys to recommend me or drop some recommendations down below, Marcus Dupree would make for a great video and... 
yeah, thank you for the recommendation and hope you enjoy. Oh yeah, too, while I'm thinking about it, on the last video we made about Marcus Vick, I'm sure some of you saw that video, everyone in the comments section, I saw the comments was saying, Matt, how did you not know Michael Vick had a brother? Because I told you guys, yeah, I never heard of Marcus Vick before I did the video. Some people were saying, oh, well, you're not a real college football fan if you don't know who Marcus Vick was. And when Marcus Vick, to give you some context here, was playing college football, I was three years old. Most of y'all know this, I'm 24 years old. So yeah, I didn't grow up watching Marcus Vick. I started keeping up with college football right at the age of seven and eight, but anything before that, no, too young to remember. I did want to explain that a little bit. However, with Marcus Dupree, I have heard of his name before, although I didn't really know the details to his story before I did all my research and gathering information. I've heard his name from time to time. And I did a lot of research for this video because there's not a lot of information about Marcus Dupree just because of how mysterious his story is. And I actually paid to watch a two hour documentary on him. And I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I'm kind of stingy. I didn't wanna pay the whatever it was, I think it was like five to six dollars to watch the documentary, but I'm glad I did because I learned so much more information on Dupree and that's more information I can give you guys in this video. And not just the documentary itself, but looking at all the articles, gathering information, there is a ton of work that goes into these videos behind the scenes. So if you do enjoy story videos like these, college football, sports in general, consider subscribing. Can't emphasize it enough. It helps on the channel tremendously. And one more thing, and trust me, I know you're tired of me jibber jabbering. Leave some recommendations for story videos down below. And as you've seen, we make videos on content you guys want to see. Your boy Matt is a fan of the people, and I want to give the people what they want. Get you a snack, get you a popcorn, get you a ferret meal you like to eat and watch a video, because trust me, I do the same thing. But all right, Matt, blah, blah, shut the crap up. Now, I'm for that do. Let's get in. Man, oh man, good old Marcus Debris. Come on, man. Don't act brand new around here. You already know. To get into his story, we got to throw it all the way back to where things started. Mr. Marcus Dupree grew up in a very small town in the state of Mississippi that goes by the name of Philadelphia. It was extremely clear and evident at a young age that Marcus, he was just bigger, stronger, and faster than all of his peers growing up. And it got to the point where as an eighth grader, varsity coaches all around his area was like, oh yeah, this guy can start as a varsity running back right now. So the varsity head coach went to talk to Marcus's mother and she wasn't too big of a fan of it because she didn't want her son to get hurt playing at that level, but Marcus, he wanted to do it. And let's just say, once Marcus started playing varsity football, the rest was history. This right here is Joe Wood, the head coach at the time for Marcus, and he stated, I don't know how true this is, but according to him, nine out of 10 times when teams would kick the ball to him, he returned it back for a touchdown. So finally, teams, they started catching on to it, so they tried to squib it up the middle. And what would happen is, whoever caught the ball, whether it be a tie in or something, they'd catch it, and they'd toss it back to Marcus, and he'd still run it in for a touchdown. And I could sit up here for the next 20 minutes, hyping up his high school career all the way from his freshman year to his senior year, but I think you get the point. He was dominating the competition. And when it was all said and done, he had over 7,000 rushing yards with 87 touchdowns, and that broke the national high school record at the time that was set by Herschel Walker. As far as it goes for his recruiting process, it was nothing short than straight up madness. Like I told you guys in the intro, there was coaches lining up just trying to have a meeting with him and his mother every single day after school until 10 p.m. that night. To go on top of that, when he wasn't meeting with coaches for those six hours or he had a break or something, he's taking phone calls from coaches left and right. And for a lot of young athletes, that's the dream. And I even remember as a kid myself, I used to think, man, that'd be awesome if colleges are calling me 24 seven and send me mail all the time and wanting to meet with me because they want me to play for their school. And to a certain extent, I think it is cool, but when it gets to a level like this, it's toxic and mentally it's draining. And it got to the point where Marcus, he was being pulled this way by one person, this way by another, he couldn't even think for himself. To go on top of that, he wasn't just being affected. His family, cousins, friends, uncles, everybody around him, even his high school coach was being affected. His high school coach stated every single day he got over 100 phone calls. And there were colleges calling his friends saying, hey, if you can convince Marcus to come to our college, we'll give you a house. We'll give you whatever you want. Cars, money, etc. You name it, we'll give it to you. And for everything I just said, that is why I label him as the most sought after recruit of all time because I've heard some wild recruitment stories where they offer a bunch of money, but never anything quite like this. I've never heard of a scenario where you got coaches sitting outside a guy's house all day, every day, and then they're poaching not him, but his friends as well. There were stories going around that these coaches would show up to his house and offer his mom a briefcase full of money. And I hope what I'm about to say next, it really puts into perspective of just how big of a recruiting battle was going on for Marcus Dupree. Texas and Oklahoma both sent a recruiter to live 
in Mississippi full time just to see him and talk to him every single day. I'm going to say that one more time. Texas and Oklahoma both sent a recruiter to live there full time because I guess they thought it'd help him a little bit. And in January, Marcus took an official visit to Texas and he liked what he saw. And on the spot, he told the coach, hey, I'm committing here. But that is when the current head coach at the time that goes by the name of Fred Akers was like, well, hold on, hold on. Let's call your mom first and see what she says about this. And she was on board with it, so he was going to Texas. It seemed like Marcus Dupree was going to go to Texas and be a legend there, but a couple of weeks before signing day, his mom told him, well, why don't you go take that visit to Oklahoma? It's not going to hurt you, and you earned it, so go have fun. And Marcus said, you know what? That sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's do it. And I want to make this clear. When Marcus was going to the Oklahoma visit, he had no intention of decommitting from Texas. He was full-on happy there. He just went to Oklahoma because his mom told him to go enjoy himself, and it was more of a why-not type of thing. You got to understand the scenario here. Marcus Dupree is a guy who grew up in a family that wasn't that wealthy, and according to some people, he never even left the state of Mississippi. So to go on a visit, that's almost like a vacation to him. And I think I speak for most people when I say this. It's cool to go out there and see the world, and especially if they're paying for all of it, yeah, why not take it? So he did it. But here's where things get interesting. I'm telling you guys, this has to be one of the most intriguing recruitment stories you're ever going to hear. When Texas was hosting Marcus Dupree for his official visit, they flew in Earl Campbell to get Marcus Dupree and escort him back to the university. Somehow, someway, Oklahoma caught wind of that and said, hmm, that sounds like a good idea. Let's see if we can one-up them. Oklahoma proceeds to send Billy Sims, former Heisman Trophy running back in 1978, to Marcus Dupree's high school. And according to some of Marcus's friends, it was stated that Billy Sims was one of Marcus's heroes. So that was a big-time deal for him. And I'm trying to put that in perspective here. Imagine when you were in high school, or some of my people, if you are currently in high school, you're an athlete, and one of your favorite football players of all time, they come to pick you up and escort you on a visit to whatever college you're going to. I guess the equivalent of that now in 2024 would be if Texas Tech is recruiting you and Patrick Mahomes shows up to your school and you fly in a private plane with him to Texas Tech University. The visit winds up going good. Remember though, he's still committed to Texas and the news comes out that he'll be signing soon. And to make a long story short, Marcus, he somewhat shocks the entire world and announces he's gonna be signing with Oklahoma. But this is where now a guy that goes by name of Ken Fairley, and remember this guy for later in this video, he comes into play. Ken Fairley was associated with Southern Miss, and he had a play in DeMarcus Dupree's recruitment process. And you'll see this as we get farther in this video. He manipulated Marcus Dupree and his entire family. And the way this Ken guy manipulated Marcus and his entire family is disgusting because he was telling them, oh, well, all these other schools, they're going to buy you. But if you come to Southern Miss... We're not going to do that. They had a campaign quote or phrase that went something like, quote unquote, don't sell yourself short. And it's very weird because Ken Fairley wasn't even a coach or anything like that at Southern Miss. And most people just label him as a quote unquote friend of Marcus Dupree's. And here's why it's relevant to Marcus signing with Oklahoma, because right after he signed, he called Ken Fairley. And when Marcus called Ken Fairley, he told him, quote unquote, I've made a terrible mistake. I do not want to go to Oklahoma. When I first heard that statement, it gave me chills because, well, you'll see in a couple of minutes. Regardless of him quote unquote not wanting to go to Oklahoma, he still goes. And he gets to campus and within one week of practice, according to the head coach at the time, Barry Switzer, he's the best player on the team. And according to James Hale, who was a reporter for Oklahoma at the time, he shredded Oklahoma's defense, who at the time, remember, was the number one defense in the country. He was completely terrorizing them in practice, but Here's where things start to get weird. Barry Switzer was saying otherwise. Oklahoma's head coach winds up going to the media and tells him, oh yeah, he didn't block good, he didn't have that good of a day, and everybody else associated with Oklahoma, they're confused and they're just mind blown. They're like, what is this guy talking about? He's the best player on the field. And Oklahoma's head coach reasoning for knocking him down pretty much and not hyping him up is because he didn't think it'd be a good look to hype up a freshman. And that really rubs me the wrong way because one thing I learned about Marcus Dupree when I was doing all my research for this video is he is an extremely humble guy. He would do anything for anybody. He wasn't this guy on the football field that was showboating. He didn't do any of that. And for some players, yes, being hard on him, it works, but for others, not so much. And Marcus wasn't really a fan of a guy just continuing to belittle him time after time after time when Marcus was the best player on the team. And I wasn't around to see Barry Switzer coach at Oklahoma, but the way he treated Marcus, 
He was a butthole to him. And yet again, his whole reasoning for not giving him what I think is just the respect he's earned on the field is because he's a young guy and he doesn't want to hype him up. But that doesn't make any sense to me. It's not even hyping him up. The guy's one of the best players in the nation, and you're going to the media talking about how bad he is. And it actually got to the point where Marcus, he started asking people on the coaching staff, yo, why is Barry Switzer riding me so hard? And in the first three games of the season, Marcus barely even played, and Oklahoma lost two of those first three games. And it even got to the point where news articles were talking about Barry Switzer should be fired. And in an interview, Marcus was talking about, look, I'm not dumb. I knew I was the best player on the team, and I should have been out there playing. So what does he do? He calls back home to his mom, talks about his frustrations, and... She calls the head coach. She calls Barry Switzer. And this is where Marcus's mom tells Barry, hey, if you don't play him, he's coming back home. Shortly after that phone call, Marcus Dupree, he took over and he took over fast, starting out against Texas in 1982. And after that Texas game in that 1982 season, Dupree continued to go on a tear. Nobody could stop him. For that entire season, he had 905 rushing yards, averaging 7 yards per carry and 12 touchdowns. But although he was running all over these teams left and right, the complications with the coaching staff, they were still ongoing. You see, Marcus Dupree and the coaching staff, the reason they collided and bumped heads so much is because the coaching staff was pissed off that he didn't have to try that hard in practice. And it's not that he wasn't trying hard, it was just solely due to the fact that he was that much better than everybody else. He was a very laid-back guy, he didn't talk a lot, and when he would do the drills, he would keep to himself. And yeah, it would look like he's not running that fast, but that's just how it looks to you. In reality, you couldn't catch him on the field if you wanted to. And here's my biggest takeaway. I think the coaching staff was low-key jealous of him, and they were pissed off that he was that much better than themselves and everybody else. I get the sense and vibe that Barry Switzer was envious of Marcus Dupree, that he had all these guys working. Remember, this is back in the 1980s. He had all these guys staying for three to four years, and Dupree comes in, and within one week, he's the best player on the team. I don't think Barry Switzer liked that. And one of the coaches even said you couldn't say anything to him because when those lights came on or whenever he stepped out there on game day, it was like a light switch. He turned it on, and he couldn't be stopped. And that's why I say you got practice players and game players. If you ever played sports, you know. I'm not lying. I played with guys that were 99 overalls in practice. They were the second coming of Michael Jordan. But they get into the game, and they're a 19 overall, and they just suck. They can't even dribble. They can't shoot. They can't do anything. Some guys are really good in practice, but they just can't perform under pressure. But getting back on track here, Oklahoma, they wound up making it to the bowl game in which they was playing Arizona State and Phoenix. And they had a long break in between that bowl game and the game before, so Barry Switzer and the coaching staff, they said the players they could go home for a couple of weeks, and that's what Marcus Dupree did. He went home. Well, when Marcus returned to the team, according to Oklahoma, he was 10 pounds overweight. And it was stated that he couldn't even make it through the sprinting drills and practice leading up to the game against Arizona State. And here's a fun fact for you. Arizona State was the number one team in rushing defense that year. So everybody on Oklahoma, they're freaking out. Marcus Dupree, he's overweight, and we're playing the top rushing defense in the nation. This isn't a recipe for success. But guess what? None of that mattered because Marcus Dupree completely, and I mean completely, shredded Arizona State. But whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. I know that sounds great, but there was some controversy going on with this performance. The reason I say that is because throughout this game, he went down with injury roughly five to six times. But apparently and allegedly, he wasn't actually hurt. He was just quote-unquote winded. So what would happen in this game is Dupree, every single time he broke off a long run, where that's 40, 50 yards, he'd go down with injury, but he wasn't actually hurt. He was just, in other terms, tired. Now, it is worth being mentioned and throw in there. He was battling what some people labeled as a minor hamstring injury. So maybe that played into it a little bit. And when it was all said and done, as you can see right here, Dupree, he only had 19 carries, but he had 245 yards. And everybody agrees on this. If he would have been in shape and he was ready to go in that game and he didn't go out as much as he did, he would have had over 400 yards easily. Oklahoma did wind up losing this game 32-21, and following the game, a reporter asked the head coach if Marcus was out of shape, and here's what he stated, quote-unquote. He's a little heavy. I think he probably would have scored on two runs if he had been down to 228. At the time, this was a very, very, and I mean a very bad look for Coach Switzer, and everybody agrees on that. He shouldn't have stated that. I want you to think about what transpired here. He blamed, pretty much here, the loss 
on a young freshman running back in Marcus Dupree, who in which, in this same game, had 245 rushing yards. Think about that. He stated, yeah, Marcus Dupree, he's overweight and out of shape, and that's why we lost. Period. The end. And let's just say, yeah, he wasn't in shape, and he was overweight. Number one, you don't say that to the media. You keep that internal with the team. And number two, he still had 250 rushing yards. But it goes back to what I've been telling you guys. Ever since he got to Oklahoma, in week one, him and the coaching staff, including the head coach more importantly, bumping heads nonstop. It was never a good fit, and I don't even know why he decided to go there. My only assumption is, is what sold him on going to Oklahoma is when Billy Sims came to his high school because that was his hero. And here we are, we're heading into the offseason, and even with Marcus and his coaching staff bumping heads, he is still easily one of the best players in the nation. So Sports Illustrated, they decided to do an interview with him. And in this interview, this is where he stated, at Oklahoma, it's not fun. Marcus did come out and state that that was blown way out of proportion, but still, it's obvious, him and the Oklahoma coaching staff, not the bestest of friends, I think that's more than fair to say. And he winds up returning to Oklahoma, heading into that 1983 season, and there's a lot of talks about him potentially winning the Heisman Trophy. But him and Oklahoma, they got off to yet again in our slow start, and he got injured against Ohio State early in the season. He would eventually come back from that injury, but unfortunately, he got injured again on a huge hit against Texas. Him and a Texas defender, they hit each other head on, and it was so bad that when Marcus Dupree got up, he walked in the Texas huddle. Eventually, he made his way off the field, in which he later stated he didn't know how he even walked off the field, and it felt like he was in a dream. Obviously, goes without being said, he had a concussion. To go on top of that concussion, Oklahoma, they lost the game to Texas, and Marcus at the time thought, oh yeah, well, if we lost to Texas, my chances of winning the Heisman Trophy, they're down the drain, so there's really no more motivation left for him. Fast forward in time here, he wound up deciding to go back home for a little bit, and on a Monday, he was supposed to get back on a plane to go to Oklahoma. And here's where things get really interesting. His friend drops him off at the airport, but he never boards the plane. An entire week went by, and here we are. The number one running back in the nation, Marcus Dupree, is missing in the midst of the college football season. His mom didn't know where he was at, football team didn't know where he was at, nobody knew what was going on. He is officially reported as a missing person. The FBI is looking for him, and he turns up a week later, and he's just chilling in Mississippi. There's nothing wrong with him. He's just, I guess, trying to stay out the way and mind his own business. He calls his Oklahoma head coach, Barry Switzer, and Switzer tells him, hey, if you don't come back here, you're done. You're suspended. And to make a long story short here, Marcus, he decided that he didn't want to return to Oklahoma, and that's all she wrote. He was done being a Sooner. By this point in time in our story, Marcus Dupree is talking to Ken Fairley, and Ken's trying to tell him, hey, you got to go to Southern Mississippi. This is a great move, great decision. But this is why I say the Ken Fairley dude is shady, because he knew what was going to happen next. Marcus Dupree enrolls at Southern Miss. Looks like he's going to play football there, but like Lee Corso says, not so fast, my friend. Not only did he have to sit out the rest of the 1983 season, but he also had to sit out the entire 1984 season as well. So two whole years. And Marcus was like, nope, can't have it. There's no way I'm sitting out two years. So he doesn't even play a down for Southern Miss, and he's in a tricky predicament and situation here because it seems like the only choice on the board is to turn into a professional athlete. However, why that was so controversial at the time is because he wasn't eligible for the NFL draft. So the only real option he had was to join the USFL. And this is where he signed to the New Orleans Breakers for a five-year, $5 million contract, and that was huge. So although it was a bumpy ride to get to where he was at, it seemed like everything was going to work out. But here's where our Ken Fairley character here, he comes back into play. Ken was pretty much Marcus's agent slash financial advisor. And with Marcus being, I'm not going to label him as a pushover, but an extremely nice guy, he always saw the good in people. And he chose to see the good in Ken, I guess because he was a good talker or something, and Ken completely screwed him over. Remember, Marcus signed a five-year, $5 million contract. If he played his cards right, that could have potentially been enough to retire off of. But here's the kicker with that. Marcus signed over his power of attorney to Ken. As to why he did that, I have no idea, but it goes to prove you gotta have the right people in your life or they will screw you over. And when Marcus got his first paycheck, it was $42,000, but he never saw a penny of it because it just went straight to Ken. His signing bonus on that $5 million deal was $300,000, and he never saw a penny of that. And Ken told him that every single check he got, including that signing bonus, it was being invested in a separate account, in which Marcus didn't have any access to whatsoever. And this is where Marcus, I guess just being a little naive, stated, oh, well, I just figured it was being put into a savings account for me. And here's what Marcus stated, quote unquote, but my grandmother told me from the start that she didn't like Ken and didn't trust him. She 
kept saying, something ain't right about that guy. As usual, my grandmother proved to be right again. I wanna show you this quote as well. It goes to show you how sad the situation really was because Marcus, he just wasn't aware of what was going on. Quote unquote, Ken had gotten power of my attorney. When I got ready to buy my mother a car, I said, let me check with Ken. She said, check with Ken? Why do you have to check with him? Then it sort of hit me, yeah. Why do I always have to check with Ken if I want my own money? I can't tell you enough how bad I feel for Marcus because he thought Ken was a friend of his and he thought he was helping him, but he was doing the complete opposite. And meanwhile, all that's going on behind the scenes on the field, it still wasn't too much better. He wasn't terrible, but he wasn't anything special for the Breakers. In that first season, he had a couple 100 yard games, but shortly after in the 1985 season, he suffered a very bad knee injury. The knee injury was so bad that one doctor told him to give it up and never even attempt to play football again. He wound up having knee surgery, and it's crazy to think about everything I talked about, this has all happened before his 21st birthday, think about that. And after that knee injury, he was done. He officially retired, but it was extremely weird because he was only 22, 23 years old. He wasn't doing anything for a long time besides sitting around the house. And it was stated that Marcus got up to 300 pounds. It was bad. One of his friends stated when he visited him, he looked like an old man. Reminder, we're talking about a 23 year old already looking that bad. But here's a turning point in our story because you're probably thinking we're at the end and he's going out sad, but no, nah, that's not happening here. Marcus wound up attending an NFL game in which he was watching the players out there and he was like, you know what? I can be better than those guys. So he turned his life around. He started working out relentlessly every day and he lost 100 pounds in just three to four months. Shortly after that, he landed a tryout with the Rams who which drafted him 12th in the 1986 NFL draft in case he was gonna play in the NFL. And he wound up playing two years for the Rams in 1990 and 1991. Granted, he barely played for him, only had 251 total yards in the NFL, but who cares? The fact he pretty much retired and came back to the NFL, that's insane, especially for a running back. The Rams did wind up releasing him, and when he was asked about it, he said he wasn't even mad because he gave it everything he had. After his football career, he got a CDL because he stated, hey, if I'm in and out of jobs, I can always drive a truck because there's always going to be a need for that. So that was good, but although he had a CDL, he was always switching jobs from time to time, trying out new things. And oh yeah, you remember that Ken Fairley guy that screwed over Marcus Dupree? Well, he got canned in 2016 and he got sentenced to prison. Although it wasn't for the things he did to Marcus Dupree, it was for some other shady stuff that he did. And his story is a different conversation for a different day. Just know he's not that great of a person. And here's what Marcus had to say about Fairley getting sentenced to prison. The chickens finally came home to roost. He finally got what he deserved. When you do wrong and just keep doing wrong, the bottom is going to finally fall out and it finally did for Ken. And as where it stands today, our current day and time 2024 for Marcus Dupree, he's just your average working man and I can't tell you enough how much I respect that and admire that. My biggest takeaway from Marcus isn't anything on the football field, although he was a phenomenal talent, it's that he's just a good and solid dude. As crazy as his story was, he never got in off the field trouble, not even to the slightest of bit. I never heard or saw anybody say a single bad thing about him off the field either. And the way he is now, and the way his life is, I think that's how he wanted to be on the football field. Just show up for work and go home and for everybody else to leave him alone. And what saddens me the most about this is his quote unquote financial advisor, Ken Fairley, taking all of his money. And also too, the way the Oklahoma coaching staff treated him wasn't the best and it, it made his college experience miserable. And because of stories like this, this is why I'm in favor of the transfer portal. Because if the transfer portal was around back then when all this transpired, he wouldn't have had to leave Southern Miss. He could have played there right away. He would have had to sit out the remainder of the season he transferred in the midst of, but the next season he'd have been able to play. You get what I'm trying to say. All in all though, what a story though, what a story. This has been one of the longest videos I've ever made on the channel. So. Hopefully you guys enjoyed, and if you want to see more videos like this, let me know in the comment section. Also, let me know your thoughts down below. But, uh, Robin!